Yeah. Yes. Uh, so this this lady came in when I was a second year fellow. I mean, she's 32. She's got reported anxiety. She's had thyroid uh, cancer, but she got removed years ago. And then she was recently diagnosed with PTSD by her primary care. You know, he was saying she was having trauma from her surgery um, and basically you know, she was just feeling palpitations. So basically she'd been feeling palpitations since 2014 when she di got diagnosed with thyroid cancer and then they increased in 2020. Um, and she had had multiple episodes, um, mainly with orthostatic positioning. Um, she'd been coming in more frequently to see. Visits, um, and basically he got lab work, everything looked fine, and he referred her for to psych for anxiety attacks. Um, that day she was at a friend's house. She was just sitting on the picnic table and she started feeling it again and started feeling like really, um, really lightheaded when she was just sitting down. She wasn't anxious at all. She was having a good day. Um, and when she came in, she, you know, they increased her venlafaxamine and when she came in, uh, she had been feeling flush. She was having some lightheadedness. She was having some joint pains, um, but no actually pain, um, with any range of motion or decreased range of motion. Everything else is normal. Um, she was a little sinus tack when she came in. Her blood pressure was otherwise fine. She's sat in fine. She's afebrile. Physical exam was unremarkable, and this is the EKG that they got on her in triage. Um, it was busy in the emergency department that night, um, so they just did. Sitting there, she started having some palpitations again. So luckily, while she was still had the EKG set up, this is the this is what happens. And, and obviously, you know, they run her back into the room. Um, and when she basically lays down flat in the ER as they're getting ready to you know put the pads on and everything she kind of breaks out of it and then she starts going into this kind of rhythm uh, which she basically go back into this rhythm uh, if you laid her back flat again she would go back into this uh, so they talked to cards and cards said you know give her a 150 of amio and put her on a drip um, and work her up from there so you know no white count Electrolytes are a little bit low, potassium is a little bit low, mag is a little low, which got repleted. Her tropes are negative, BMP is negative, UDS is basically unremarkable. She's not pregnant and her thyroid wasn't out of whack. Sorry, Jack, can you go back to the EKG where that it there's looks no like real, no. Say that one more time. You go back to the EKG where uh, the one where she sustained in what looks like BT. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess like here it does meet criteria for BT and not aberrancy because you see like the RS complexes are pretty wide. Um, you know, even though it looks like dimorphic in B2 to yeah. B5. And we're going to go. And the... Okay, if you're going over that, never mind. Yeah, no, we're going to go over all of it. All right. Uh, basically, echo doesn't show any like real big LVH. You know, it's otherwise normal. There's no focal wall motion abnormalities and there's some mild diastolic dysfunction, right? So she ends up getting sent out to Penn and they end up doing like a VT ablation study um, and everything was fine. Young, she had a history uh, and the only thing that was weird about her was her, you know, her orthostasis induced VTAC, which I don't think I've ever seen before. Um, so just looking at ryth uh, rhythms, you know, how do we look at them? Or, it's, you know, first one is, you know, are they stable or they're not stable? And it, it's not just the blood pressure, right? This is mentation. This is oxygenation, um, modeling of the skin. So even with a normal blood pressure, if they're, you know, on supplemental, like, you know, on a bunch of supplemental oxygen, like a non-rebreather, uh, um, that's unstable, right? If their mentation, you know, is questionable, you, know, you can make the argument that that's unstable. It's not just a blood pressure issue. Right, they're either tachycardic or they're not tachycardic. You're either seeing P waves or you're not seeing P waves. It's either regular or irregular, and then it's wide or narrow. And from there, like you kind of can kind of break down your differential. So first thing is pads on, are they stable or not? And then tachy or not, P waves or not, regular or not, wider. EKG, every rhythm that you look at, you should be thinking in that manner, right? So 
you know, P waves are small. Um, you can confuse them with like like really like a prolonged uh, QT interval or some even some U waves or you know they can be artifact. Um, remembering that you know our anatomy that you know sinus conduction bends in the right upper atrium and then kind of goes down um, down to the left. Um, so V one is our you know is the lead that's you know kind of up there in the top. Of, uh, for P waves, um, in that you know, changing some of the lead placement can enhance our view of V1. So that's really talking about something's called Lewis leads. Um, so you just basically, you know, reposition our our um, our right atrium uh, uh, electrodes, um, kind of over, move your left lower limb over, um, and what it does is it really, you know, brings. or kind of going around that right upper uh, atrium quadrant of the heart. Um, so you can take an EKG that kind of looks questionable. I don't see any P waves or not. And then you know when you're looking at with the Lewis leads, like you can clearly identify some P waves. So that's just one little trick if you can't see it or not um, or undetermined. Um, and then obviously, you know, how we classify or narrow regular, narrow irregular, wide regular, and then wide irregular, which is irregular because you're worried about like the AFib with WPW and that you can't necessarily give any sort of beta blocking agents to those. But for the most part, you know, wide regular um, is looking at, you know, ventricular tachycardia, hyperkalemia, or like there's, you know, like Uday was saying is that you have some sort of uh, AV NRT or AVRT with a, with a, uh, with a bundle branch block, you know, with an underlying level. They didn't at baseline she doesn't have a bundle branch block so it would be weird for her um, to develop a conduction block and then go plus y complex so and we knew her potassium you know wasn't wasn't high so really for this lady you know it's it's vtac until proven otherwise um so you know you, you can always use you know the wider uh mnemonic um basically is this afib with wpw um and that you'll see that it's wide Yeah, you know, something with a bundle branch blocks, you know, is this a sodium channel uh, blocker uh, from like a drug overdose? You know, is this electrolytes, mainly the hyperkalemia, um, or is this, you know, all signs of ischemia? And, and basically it's, it's it's ischemic until proven otherwise. All right. All right, so basically to quantify VTAC a little bit more, you know, looking at it's, you know, three or consecutive more Y complex beats with the Q rate that's generally got to be greater than uh, 120. Um, you know, you start to get in this weird range um, when it's like 60 to 120 of what is that? Um, and if it's under 60, then we typically qu quantify like Y complexes as, you know, junctional or junctional escape or something like that. Um, really, you know, you want it to be above above 120. Um, you can be a little bit lower than that. Um, and Um, and then anything above, you know, two, two, 250 is, is no longer VTAC. It's just, it's just basically um, VFib. Um, and then there are a couple of different um, mimics of VT, which we're just, we're going to go over and be aware of. So this is the differential, really, when you start talking about, you know, ventricular tachycardia. Um, you know, the mimics, the bidirectional, the monodirectional, the sustain. Um, is technically uh, ventricular tachycardia. Um, you have a fascicular block with ventricular tachycardia, and then there is something called familiar catecholamine polymorphic VT, um, which I don't. I, I think that's going to be a diagnosis that's going to be made at Penn. Um, and so, <clears throat> mainly we're we're looking for why are they having you know the ventricular arrhythmia, and the most common cause almost always is ischemic. taking a new drug, um, are they having just like poor PO intake, diarrhea, anything that would cause their, you know, potassium, magnesium, calcium uh, to all kind of go down? Um, are they getting more stretch from their exacerbate, from their, uh, from their congestive heart failure that's messing with like some scar tissue that they may have? Um, and or did somebody just recently change their antiarrhythmic? Like those are the things that we should be kind of going down, but basically it's ischemia, 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 ischemia until so 
you know, um, when you you're kind of, you know, you'll see this thing and, and they talk about, you know, um, <clears throat> with if you have a left bundle branch block or you have um, a pacemaker in, it's kind of hard to determine if there's a scheme or not. Um, but uh, Scarbosa basically came up with a set of criteria. I tend to think of them as uh, A, B, and C. Basically, uh, if if you block or right bond or branch block, if you ever get ST elevation in your anterior leads, like boom, that's it, you're done. Um, if there's extreme um, concordance, you know, normally with a left bundle branch block, you don't see these depressions um, in V1, 2, and 3. Um, so if you're ever seeing, you know, significant depressions, like kind of moving uh, with the left bundle, like that's also concerning. And then the third criteria is probably the most not a concept of extreme discordance. Um, if, you know, if the SEA segment is rising above a certain degree, um, really, uh, and you know, Smith is uh, is an emergency physician out of Hennepin. Um, he did something called the modified Smith Scarbosa criteria, which basically looks at if you have discordance um, and uh, where the ST elevation is basically greater than a third of your QRS segment, um, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, second criteria are extremely uh, sensitive and specific. The third one um, has some uh, sensitive, has more sensitive, but not very specific. So what they saw um, when you were, you know, calling these ischemic events based on Scarbosa's uh, C criteria is that they were getting a lot of like uh, negative cats um, with the, you know, more change to see what is the relation to it as a, to the QRS. You they're losing the sensitivity. So uh, basically, uh, we've diagnosed it, and now what we what are we going to do about it? Um, there's no one single criteria on that where you know it, that promises you that it this is going to be VTAC versus SVT with an aberrancy. Um, basically, anybody who's unstable, you're just going to shock them. Um, just because somebody breaks. that it's SVT with aberrancy. I think that's a very common misconception saying, I don't know what it is, they're stable. Let's give a little bit of adenosine and slow it down and then they end up breaking and then you say, oh, well, if they broke with adenosine, it must be um, uh, an SVT, which is absolutely not true. Um, and then specifically for anybody who has, you know, Y complex tachycardia with a known history of coronary artery disease, uh, it's ischemic until proven otherwise. And the reason why that is increase in your pretest probability um, that it's VT um, as opposed to SVT with aberrancy. And as you get older, that pretest probability goes up. So, you know, with somebody who already, you know, I'm sure if you guys talk to Sherrod or spend any time around Sherrod, you're going to have, you know, be, you're going to want to stop hearing about pretest probability. But I think this is the one where you really got to hammer home is that with this high of a pretest probability, else, um, that is pushing against VT, uh, your post-test probability is still going to be very high. You know, like there's still at least a 40 to 50 percent chance that this is VT, even if everything else is uh, pointing against it. And it's just because that's how much more common ischemic is in these patients than uh, anything else. So <clears throat> there are, you know, um, you know, when cardiologists are looking at this or EPs are looking at this, what any signs that are very specific um, for VT. And so what that basically looks like is, you know, are there, is there AV dissociation where you see P waves that are coming through, um, but that they're not getting conducted, which means that, you know, clearly what is going, whatever's going on um, is below the AV node and therefore must be a ventricular arrhythmia. Um, do you get a capture beat where it looks like you're having a, you know, while you'll throw a normal complex in there. And that's telling you also that the rate is going below uh, the AV node and it's a ventricular rhythm, or do you, you know, kind of get this fusion beat where they try to throw a normal sinus rhythm type beat, um, but the VTAC overrides it. Um, again, indicating that all of this is coming from, uh, <coughs> coming from the, the ventricle itself. And then if you kind of look, um, 
Um, what they'll talk about is, you know, is that you have uh, a positive QRS in AVR um, and that you're negative and lead one and AVF. And what that's really basically trying to say is, is that there's such an extreme axis deviation that it must be ventricular um, to get, you know, a high, you know, a very positive in AVR um, and that there's absolutely no way that this can be conducted. left it must be coming um you know from a, di a much different axis um and then you know some of the more or less criteria so if you ever see a capture beat av dissociation or fusion beat you're done like the diagnosis is bt um some of this you know extreme axis in avr is a little bit less specific and then what they also look at is you know positive you know, extremes of concordance right and so is it is it all negative is it all positives and so it can be either one that normal progression um, from positive, uh, from, you know, from, uh, from uh, negative to positive. Um, it's either got to be all negative or all positive. So the extremes of concordance really increase the likelihood that this is, that this is VTAC. So remember, you know, fusion beads, capture beads, uh, AV dissociation, and then extremes of concordance, um, positive or negative, all push uh, the likelihood something else um, and then <clears throat> remember that it's very specific for the heart rate right if it's it has to be above 120 if it's not above 120 you really need to start thinking about the mimics I'm not saying that it can't be it's just that it, you need to really increase the likelihood of what's going on right if it's under 120 is this um, just acute intraventricular uh, rhythm is it hyperkalemia or do they have some sort of sodium channel going on if really wide over 200 because remember for VTAC it just has to be above 120 um, then that you have like what's called the really raw really wide um, tachycard really wide wide complex um, mainly this is that you know the the one, each beat is going to be uh, bigger than one big box on EKG um, this is only really ever seen in toxicologic or metabolic problems mainly hyperkalemia being the most sensitive you know or that you know there's a sodium channel blocker that answer to that is basically bicarb right if it's hyper Um, but bicarb is, bicarb is probably indicated there. Um, and then if it's a sodium channel blocker, obviously you're going to want to get sodium uh, to kind of help block up that channel to displace the drug, in which case bicarb is still the answer. So for really wide complex, over 200, over one big box, um, your first drug of choice should be bicarb. Okay, <clears throat> so accelerated intraventricular rhythm. Um, so this is basically where you have a wide complex tachycardia It's like no man's land, right? It's not junctional, but it's not fast enough, right? Um, specifically, you want to you'll think about this in patients who have just had a stent placed, where they'll have a couple of run, like they'll have a couple of like ectopy beads. They might be, you know, three or more, but they're not sustained. The rate never extremely goes, you know, that that fast. Um, these patients almost never have hemodynamic instability. Um, and the answer is you just sit on your hands and you do absolutely nothing because if you give these patients fusion beats um, if you block down their heart with basically almost any of the drugs right that's where you get in trouble and you'll just send them in the asystole so I mean I thought that I haven't seen these patients so hot so have so much ectopy that I don't end up putting them on a beta blocker but I kind of watch them for a while and see if they're still doing it and then I might put them in something that um, doesn't necessarily have an extremely long half-life but is absolutely not amiodarone Right. Um, and then we have, you know, our kind of sodium channel blocker um, toxicity. These, you know, again, um, really have, you know, they almost have what looks like a. Um, oh, I'm blanking. Uh, like a dog pattern. Like the peak dog pattern. Like they almost have like a type one Brugada pattern um, and V1, V2. Um, and the other thing is that it's, you know, uh, the um, it's the tall R wave and AVR um, that also kind of uh, goes with those. So if you see this like pseudo Brugada pattern in somebody who's, you know, maybe have some sort of drug ingestion, the answer is either A, they stress themselves out and they've 
or B, you know, this can be um, a sodium channel blocking agent that they took. Um, mainly it's like, you know, historically it's always been amitriptyline, um, but there are other ones out there now. But it's the uh, it's the tall R wave in AVR um, that really seals that diagnosis um, because Brugada does not come with that. All right, <clears throat> so this is probably where um, some of the uh, things that, you know, counted that much, um, but um, this happens very frequently with patients with ICDs. I, I just had one the other day in the ER at Atlantic Care, you know, 52 year old guy who's got coronary artery disease, who's got an AICD, his EF's like 20%. He basically passed out while he was putting his clothes on. He got, sh his defibrillator shocked him eight times. He got 300 of AMIO and then 150 of AMIO by medics. He got 100 of the lidocaine by the ER doc. He got in mag, he got in like a total still in VTAC, or at least in a ventricularly paced rhythm in the 140s in the ER. And so uh, mainly is that this is because they've either A, got scarring um, from their previous heart failure, um, or B, they're having an ischemic event, or C, sometimes this just excessive hyper, like sympathomimetic, like hyperactivity, like because he's in fight or flight mode, um, is just driving So um, the answer to this is, you know, if the guy's got an ACD, you can get the Boston Scientific guys to hook them up um, and confirm it, um, and you can try to overdrive, you know, pace them uh, out of it. Um, it's unlikely that a lot of drugs are really going to work in this instance because it, it's something else that's going on. It's, it's a structural issue at that point. I mean, all of these guys need a cath. Uh, so what medications do we use? So again, Edison is always the initial You know, there's signs of instability again that doesn't just have to be you know a blood pressure issue typically we synchronize them we started at 200. Um, if the patient has an AICD or pacemaker again make sure that you're not placing over that device um, and then the anterior posterior positioning in some instances for this can be more effective than the AP lateral um, and then remember it doesn't necessarily if it doesn't work the first time it, it may be a issue. And so what we saw when, you know, the dose VF trial came out, you know, last year um, where they randomized 450 patients um, in Canada um, to get, you know, either dual sequential versus standard of care or vector uh, vector controlled where they just basically went from AP uh, anterior lateral to anterior posterior. Um, basically what you see is, is that with, you know, dual sequential, um, but even with vector uh, vector going from anterior lateral to anterior posterior, your likelihood of terminating VF went up significantly, right? And so what I, you know, the I think the big takeaway from this trial was that, you know, people were saying like, oh, this kind of shows that we should be doing dual sequential defibrillation. I thought it more showed that, you know, changing the vector um, is, is sometimes easier. And if you're doing the same thing repeatedly and it's not working, that's the definition of insanity. Basically, the you know, primary outcome and the secondary outcomes, you know, Ross. Go ahead. I was going to say, I've, I've done this, I think, two or three times now. And every time, like, the nurses look at you like you're crazy because obviously it's so new. Um, and then the other issue is obviously trying to get that second um, cardiac monitor. Like, you know, we're on fourth floor. We have a guy who's in refractory defib. We had to go down to second floor to get the monitor up to basically do the dual sequence defibrillation because there's only one on the fourth floor. Yeah, and this trial, when they talked about it, they had to train the medics for a while. And in places that routinely do it, like they have a protocol for it, um, it may be something that we should look into doing um, as a QI project because it's not that it happens, this happens with frequency, but when it does happen, mainly everybody's concern um, isn't necessarily that it's going to be harmful to the patient. I, I think that we've proven um, with this trial that, you know, it's not harmful. The everybody's always concerned that if something happens to the cardiac monitor when you're you know, doing the dual sequential that it voids the warranty and, the, and these pieces of equipment are expensive um again what i would say is i would try vector change always vector change first um basically because you know it had a good odd uh, adjusted odds ratio and, and this trial was stopped early um and there was a, a low number of people i mean if you look at it there's they enrolled 400 
you know, X amount of them got down to the dual sequential uh, defibrillation pathway. So it was just a low number of patients who required that dual sequential. Um, so when that happens, your effect, you know, size, your, you know, how efficacious this is always tends to be uh, overstated. Um, and again, when they looked at it, um, there wasn't a big difference in their primary outcome, like they didn't meet statistical significance. Um, so a lot of the things that are driving the positivity of this trial were on second word. Like the study wasn't powered to show to show that. So this is great. It's thought provoking, um, but it's not the definitive word on if we should be necessarily doing this routinely or not. That's a whole bunch of stuff about how these sodium channel blockers work. Um, I'm just going to skip that because I just I, my brain doesn't function like that right now. Hey, Jared, um, to clarify. Yeah. Um, yeah. With the dual sequential, they use 360 on each life pack, and um, it was biphasic, correct? Yeah, I think when they put it on, they went they went max out on both of them. Okay. Um, so right, I think we have to check on that. Was yeah, a I double. I double. I, yeah, well, let me. I'll read the. I'll, yeah, I'll read the trial tonight and I'll come and I'll let you know because I'm actually I think that they maxed out on both of it, but I'm not a thousand percent certain. So I'll look at. OK, I know I know our I know tonight. our life facts are biphasic. I just want to double check, though. No, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure no, I'll double check. Both of them. OK. Mike, what did you say? I'm pretty sure in the trial they had maxed out both of them. I'm pretty sure they did too, because that's the only thing that makes sense for me. Because um, it's just the easiest, and if they're going to do it, they're probably going to go go big or go home. Um, but I'll actually read through the trial methods and send it out. All right. So you know, mainly with these things, you know, you're beta blocking them, you're sodium channel them, and then there's all our class three antiarrhythmics, um, beta blocker therapy. Um, really, um, you should really think against using beta blockers. Um, in in these patients, even though that's going to be their main, like their long term management, but acutely, you know, giving somebody uh, a significant, you know, beta blocker um, and just cardiac output is fraught with peril, especially if you are assuming this is ischemic in nature, which we pretty much always are. Um, and then, you know, the new kid on the block is Esmolo. And while we're talking about VTAC, you know, Esmolo always kind of pop up in these things, so. Really, there's there's very there. I mean, there's scant data. Like a total of basically, you know, in one U.S. single center, six patients got asthma plus usual. Um, everybody got ROS with the asthma and four out of six out of them achieved, you know, sustained ROS and it increased their survival to discharge with good neurologic outcomes. And then they looked at, you know, this 2016 retrospective study that was done that was come, came out of Korea where they looked at 16 patients. Who got esmolol and compared to them to 25 patients who didn't so the whole totality of the evidence for esmolol is a whopping like 60 patients um so i'm i'm so far down the algorithm that i almost have nothing left to offer uh, so that's my that's my take on point on esmolol uh, for these patients um Again, you know, antiarrhythmics, we all know them. Um, lidocaine, um, you know, when you actually look at the guidelines, you know, nobody's ever really specific for amiodarone. And, and actually, you know, lidocaine for ischemic VTAC um, is probably just as good. And then again, we bolus at one mg per kg. And then they total, you know, with an infusion of one to three uh, milligrams uh, per minute. Um, you really got to be checking, you know, lidocaine levels. Uh, on these patients where you bolus them multiple times and they're on a significant drip uh, just to watch out for toxicity. Um, basically, percanamide, you can't have, give anybody with structural heart disease, um, and and it's contraindicated in the setting of an acute MI. Um, we really are looking for complex, irregular, um, you know, looking for, you know, AFib with WPW, and then Amiodarone is pretty much uh, kind of taken over as our main drug of therapy. Um, I, I think it's just because it's the ease of, you know, bolus dosing, you know, 300 versus 150, and then you just tell them to order a drip and you, you don't have to think about it anymore. Um, but when you actually look at the data behind that, uh, so really this is kind of an algorithm. I, I 
it, you know, kind of hammers home the point of, you know, you always start um, with, you know, if they're unconscious or unstable, you know, they get shocked or plus 300. Um, but you can always reload them, right? Like just because you gave them, you know, 300 and then 150, like, you know, you're not necessarily done with the MEO. You can always bolus them with more, you know, make sure their mags are fine. Um, you can consider, you know, short acting beta blockers in these instances, um, lidocaine, you can always intubation, um, but the end result is they all go to the cath lab. Um, so when you look at amiodarone um, versus, you know, some of these other other agents, VTAC, VFib, um, really uh, it's not necessarily ever been shown that amiodarone is better than um, lidocaine or these other agents. Uh, on inferiority and that it had non-inferiority as compared to lidocaine and these other agents but it kind of got pushed um you know like you know how we went you know started using benzos for alcohol withdrawal um and so when you look at like kind of the totality of evidence that is out there where it's like lidocaine versus sololol linocaine versus procainamide linocaine versus something else procainamide versus amiodarone or lidocaine versus procainamide all work you know about the same um so it's not that ever one has been necessarily super duper better um than any of the other ones um so mainly when you're looking at you know uh, amiodarone versus lidocaine um for you know these patients with y complex out cardiac arrest you know the best data out there is the alps trial and it basically showed that they're equivocal right and it never it never actually The modified ranking was better. Their survival to hospitalization was better. That they got less shocks. Um, none of that was really true. So, you know, amiodarone is what we tend to be using now, but lidocaine is, for all intents and purposes, just as effective. Um, and then, of course, you know, Procamio was a smaller trial, but what it showed was basically procainamide um, was really, really effective. of amiodarone um but the problem with that is is that you know can't have structural heart disease and can't really be in the setting of ischemia and vt is ischemic until proven otherwise so um you know this it took them a long time to get their recruitment population you know it took them six years at 26 hospitals just to get 74 patients um and then again the sample size was too small right so it really it was under power you know, showing that procainamide could potentially be a lot better. Um, the overall study was not of superior quality. Um, and then just a couple of the nuance points um, is that, you know, a lot of these early studies kind of use the EKG for the diagnosis of VT. Um, and then uh, most uh, didn't really specify if this was all ischemic or not. um patients with mi um all these studies except one uh was all spontaneous vtac and then if they showed any signs of uh if the patient kind of is experienced you know you know acute ischemic from or from an mr you basically just need to, to to cardiovert them and so some of those patients kind of fell out of the studies um but there's no and there's no real good data out there to lidocaine so our you know our take-home points with this are you know look for p waves because that'll tell you you know kind of you know is this you know where is this coming from is this like a sinus with a bundle branch block and remember that you can always change your lead placement specifically for the lewis leads if you ever see av dissociation caption beats fusion beats extreme axes extreme positive or negative concordance all of that goes along The VTAC picture, uh, all Y complex tachycardias um, are assumed to be ischemic in nature and always assume it's VTAC. Um, if the rate is under 120 or the QTC is over 200, you need to start be thinking about the mimics, which is basically, uh, you know, reperfusion. Is this potassium? Is this a toxicity? And that uh, lidocaine and amio are about the same in terms of their efficacy. 
somewhere out there in the ether that I'm not exactly sure where to put it, um, but I'm really reaching for it. So that's um, that's my deep dive into VTAC. Hey, Jared, for that you were, uh, on that on that image for the AMIO um, algorithm, it had 900 mm -hmm. milligrams listed. Yeah. Is that a yeah. that's that's a total in a day max? I think so. I'd have to go back and double check. Really, that it's 900. I think the point here we made is if you give them 300 and if you give them 150, um, and you really think at that point amio more amiodarone is gonna not hurt you, you can always rebolus them with another 150. Because um, okay. mainly, remember why we use the amio drip is because you know you have to you bolus them and then you drip them because you have to get above the mean concentration. So you know the more of that mean concentration and, and I think the reason why we stop at after 300 and 150 um, is because you know I, I don't I'd imagine I don't actually know this but I'd imagine that if you repeatedly bolus you're going to overshoot and get into a and get into a toxicity realm um, but I don't actually know what that number is and then um, is there any utility with using like in this scenario a, a beta blocker with the amio or with the lidocaine Say that one more time. Is there any utility of using a beta blocker with the amio or lidocaine? So I don't think any study that I know of has ever actually looked at that. Um, I think I mean, I if you're getting, all listed, I'm just wondering. Like, yeah. So I think I think the answer to that is is if you're getting far enough down this algorithm, um, is that it's mainly. Use other other meth other methods, and that's that may just be to knock out their some uh, the, their uh, some sympathetic drive, right? Their fight or flight response is going to keep them in VTAC, which is ultimately why you would you know intubate them and sedate them to kind of take the patient out of the picture, uh, and then from there you know use a short uh, you know a very short acting um, beta blocker. Okay. Jared, yeah, uh, I think the other that, that's that your. I'm sorry, Uday. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that the other issue that you're going to run into is that if you're going to this refractory beta, you know, refractory VTAC, the heart's only going to be able to tolerate it for so long. Eventually, the muscle's going to give out, and I think more often than not, the patient's not going to be state hemodynamically stable, and you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot by giving metoprolol. Yeah, no, I think it's got to be short. It's got to be short acting. My hesitation, but yeah. Yeah. No, I think the, I mean one of the biggest problems is like to design a trial looking at VT storm. You just don't have enough patients to power it appropriately, so you're never going to be able to to find the conclusion that I think that we're probably looking for for this patient. Like you know, I've I've had other patients in VT storm, and I've done you know amio and lido, and then you know moved on to an esmolol drip or pushing metoprolol just because you kind of run out of other things um, and Jared I apologize I apologize because I had a couple meetings so I was kind of in and out but um, I think one of the other things you really want to consider is for these patients when you realize it's actually VT storm and not something that you can convert quickly is making sure you have a perfusionist and if you don't making sure that you contact a uh, a healthcare center that does to get them there as soon as possible because eCPR and cannulation for these patients is paramount um, if again if this is a if this is a patient that's a candidate for ECMO um, but uh, that, again, that's just kind of my general uh, approach. And uh, Jared, I've got a quick question for you. Um, has that recent retrospective trial, and again, I apologize if you mentioned this earlier, looking at better outcomes with lidocaine for in-hospital cardiac arrest as opposed to amiodarone, has that changed your practice at all? Say that one more time, Mike. I, I, if the train came by, I didn't hear it all. I'm sorry, I, I also can start to mumble when it gets later in the day. Uh, so. Um, there's a large retrospective trial looking at uh, a mortality benefit in the use of lidocaine versus amiodarone for in-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, and um, I know you and I, have, we've talked about it, but has this changed your practice at all when it comes to that particular patient population? I, I don't, I don't, I, to be honest with you, I don't think so, because I, I think, I think there's enough data out there um, that shows that, you know, some of these may show a little bit of benefit, but, you know, when you compare them head to head, none of them actually change um, so significantly enough that I would ever, you know, say if it's all in hospital, you must use uh, lidocaine. If it's coming from out of hospital, it's dealer's choice um, because 
hold true um, if you were to replicate the study? You know, I think that's fair. I mean, they, they did have a really nice, like, sizable patient um, group that they used. Um, you guys know I, I have a, uh, um, a bias because I'm a pulmonologist, and I obviously I hate all the pulmonary aspects of amiodarone. And uh, you might have mentioned this earlier, Jared, too, but your electrophysiology colleagues will appreciate the use of lidocaine only because it's so fast on and fast off that if they go to the EP lab to do an ablation, they'll be able to do uh, a more accurate job of figuring out where the focus of the VT is coming from. Uh, but again, that's a total side point because, you know, at the end of the day, you're just trying to stabilize the patient. Yeah, when I talk to the EP guys at Atlantic Care, I, they don't necessarily have a choice. I think they favor lidocaine. Um, my only problem with it is that if you've bolused them and now you're dripping them and you can't get them off of it necessarily. I've never been at a place that has lidocaine levels in house, so you send it and it's a two day setback for you. That's my only hesitation with the use of lidocaine is that we don't necessarily have rapid access to daily lidocaine levels at, at all facilities, but maybe in other parts of the country, that's that's a different story. Yeah, Jared, I echo <laughs> that too. I mean, I, I think it's like a, it's it's a very quick go to and it is um, I I find that um, uh, there might be some reticence and and lack of like less familiarity at other you know locations because amio is so much easier just to kind of grab up and and so it can be an easier one to go to but if you're in this refractory pathway they wind up on both and the problem the the factor that's the biggest problem is once you get past the first 24 hours, you have to be able to send a lidocaine level and be able to measure this over time. Um, and sometimes you've had to bolus them, you know, so much you're really concerned about toxicity. So that's that's like the big caveat is lidocaine toxicity is, I definitely worry from a pulmonary perspective for long-term effects from an amio perspective, but from a, like a CNS and acute toxicity perspective, lidocaine is one really to watch. And it's so tough because we can't get levels back. You know, one thing I've always found kind of fascinating is that, you know, lidocaine isn't even in the algorithm for quote unquote stable VTAC. Um, and again, if you if you cover this, Jared, like I said, I was in and out, so I apologize. Um, you know, it, it, it's a um, with and, uh, you know, with the thought process also of us using uh, amiodarone. So, you know, why why is it that we reach for lidocaine? Obviously, I mean, your your discussion really delved into the literature, which is fantastic. Um, I just think it's it's just interesting how we've ended up where we are when it comes to our algorithms. I think amiodarone or the makers of amiodarone gave a lot of free lunches in the late 80s, early 90s, and thus we have ended up with amiodarone. This is true. There was a blog on this. <laughs> I mean, when things don't make sense, Mike, it's generally about the money. Thanks, Jared. That was awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. No, no Dr. Ward, that was the, good. If you guys are interested for um, the VT algorithm, is a algorithm called the Brugada algorithm for di differentiating VT versus VT with a variancy. Um, and like basically what I remember is like, I use like the three D's in morphology, so direction, duration, disassociation, and then morphology. So like direction, what Jared said, you know, all going in one phase versus two. Duration, looking at the RS complex, if it's greater than 300, you just say it's BT. Uh, disassociate, either you see the dissociation or you see those capture beats or fusion beats, and then you look at uh, left bundle branch or right bundle branch morphology. And if any one of those is positive along that Brugada algorithm, it's automatically BT. And I pulled up the trial. So in the um, dose VF trial, they had two types of defibrillators. One of them was the striker, which is they in their strike in Canada, it's monomorphic. So they use 360 for that. And then for the uh, Zool defibrillator, which is biphasic, they use 200 for that.